Now EWI is very popular these days because obviously we're all trying to save fuel, we're all trying to save money and external wall insulation for some people is one of the few opportunities they got to insulate their house. Now I would like to make one small political point at this juncture and that is to say that I think that people like Insulate Britain are doing a lot of harm, have done a lot of harm to the calls and uh, you know it just means that if the government do anything now on the, the thing of insulation it looks like they've caved into this pressure group that will encourage more people to go and glue themselves to the motorways for whatever their cause is. Although I agree with insulation I don't agree with those idiots. Now the other thing is that those people from Insulate Britain most of them they have not a single clue about what is required to insulate a house. Now a lot of people in Britain are living in houses which are over 100 years old, very nice houses. I live in one myself and a lot of those houses have got solid walls. In other words, no cavities, it's just a nine inch solid brick wall. So in a house like this, when you've insulated your loft and maybe if you're lucky, you've got enough space under the floor to do some kind of insulation under the floor if it's a timber floor, Double glazing, you've got a nice draft proof door, you've done everything you can to save energy, to save money. The last place you're looking at these nine inch walls which are still leaking a fair amount of the heat. So external wall insulation is basically a kind of polystyrene material. It's not a PIR or a PUR board because they don't work so well outside under sort of damp conditions if you like. We use a polystyrene, special grade polystyrene that is screwed and glued to the wall with an adhesive and that insulation goes all the way down the outside of the wall. There's usually a little tray here at the bottom to catch it, keep the rodents out and a little capping piece at the top. Hopefully you can get this in under the eaves. It just depends how much of an overhang you've got. Sometimes they have to do a bit of jiggery pokery to make that work and how they very often do it is just with a kind of a, a capping piece like that that goes down an angled capping piece so you do find that just about in this area here you don't have any insulation and here is the problem because as diligent as the guys are who are doing this there are places where it becomes very difficult to insulate so if you had a soil stack say this was the back of the house here we've got a soil stack we've got a bathroom there and we've got the old cast iron soil stack 100 years old and we've also got maybe a boiler flue over here somewhere and the boiler flue and we've got a fence post here because we've got an alley, we've got a neighbour's fence there and we've got a back gate going through. So we've got all kinds of little places where if we're putting the external wall insulation up, we've got problems. We may even have a meter cupboard somewhere down there, you know, electricity and gas meter, and we're not gonna take that meter out and try and get insulation. So all these places, we're gonna have to cut the insulation around those obstructions, if you like, box it in. They've got special little boxing sections that they use to make a nice, neat job of it. But whatever they do, it's not gonna be 100%. You know, they're gonna do 95% of the job, maybe even more than that. But you're gonna get these little areas like this, like the fence post. They're not gonna take that fence post off the wall, but they've gotta cut down the gate. These guys aren't carpenters. They're external wall insulation fitters. They drill, they screw, they glue, and they do a bit of rendering. They ain't doing carpentry, they ain't doing plumbing, and they ain't doing gas work for sure. All these places, external wall insulation is compromised. The problem there, you've got 5% say of the house which hasn't been properly insulated up to the same standard as the rest of it. And you can say, look, I'm gonna take that 5%. 95% is a great improvement on where I was before. And if I can save that kind of heat loss, I'm happy to do it and I totally agree with that. So what we've got in this little house is we've got airborne moisture. So we've got our lovely double glazing, nice sealed up draft proof everywhere we can, cut down on all the drafts. We've also put up the external wall insulation which has cut down on micro leaks on the walls. Everything's looking snug and the house is a lot warmer than it was before and we're quite happy with that. Because it's warmer, the amount of airborne moisture that can float around the house is increased because warmer air carries more moisture. We were producing 20 litres of moisture a day, say it in the house, and if we've got extractor fans, if we're doing a good job of managing that moisture, we're getting rid of most of it at source, but we can't stop ourselves breathing, we can't stop ourselves 
producing moisture. It's up to the householder to manage that with a dehumidifier, with some kind of heat recovery, ventilation system, if you like. Anything they can do to get rid of that moisture is great. So a lot of people aren't going to do that. A lot of people are just going to live with that and they're going to build up those moisture levels and that moisture is going to float around the house because it's all nice and warm now. And what's it going to do? It's going to find a cold surface to condense on. Now, before we put up all this insulation around the outside, that cold surface was basically every outside wall. So the 20 liters was spread around the outside over the total surface area of all our outside walls. You didn't really notice it too much. If you wipe your hand across the wall, on a cold day, you might get a little bit of moisture on your hand, but most of it was condensing on the wall, soaking into the plaster, especially if it's old lime plaster. And a lot of it was migrating its way out with your heat. The heat is carrying the moisture going to the outside all the way. But now we've stuck this polystyrene on the outside. The moisture is no longer migrating to the outside as it was. It's no longer condensing on the inside on those walls because those walls are warmer. But remember these areas here where we weren't able to complete the external wall insulation are still as they were. In other words, they're still going to attract airborne moisture which is going to condense on those surfaces. So on the inside of the house, within a few months, you start noticing that you're getting a damp patch all the way around where the insulation is missing. And that damp patch turns to ugly black mold. And you're going to find around the boiler flue where they've done that, that's probably going to be all right because that's warm anyway, but you're going to find where the gate post is, you're going to find what a soil stack is, you may find this little area up the top where they were unable to get the insulation right up into the eaves and you're going to find little cold bridges all the way around the house. You may even find them on the insides of the window reveals just at that point where you've got a cold bridge and around the window frame. But you get the idea. You're going to find that it's been compromised and that all that moisture in the house, which was spread over a big distance, is now being concentrated on little areas like that. And you're getting mold build up and you're saying that external wall insulation that I had fitted is now causing me problems. Now, this isn't a criticism of the guys doing it because they're on a price. They've got to get this job done. This is a reality. All I'm saying is if you have this done, it's essential that you manage the moisture levels in your house. When you've had this job done, and it's a great idea to insulate wherever you can, it's a great idea to insulate. But the next thing you need to do, or even before it, is to look at some kind of dehumidifier, to look at some kind of air management system, to look at something that will move that moisture out of the house, monitor it, get yourself something automatic, because if you rely on yourself to do it, it's not going to be done. And this is one of the problems we have with these properties. If, if a lot of these properties are rented properties, say, and it's a housing association, which is doing its best to cut the fuel bills of its tenants, say, look, we're going to, we're going to insulate these old houses. You know, there's a long overdue for insulating. They do the best they can. But of course, because of these unavoidable facts, you cannot do anything about these bits of cold bridging. It's just totally unrealistic. Then you must take care of the airborne moisture with some kind of air management system. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm against it. I know people are looking for a black and white. Is external wall insulation a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing, but there are bad things about it. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It just means we've got to be aware of that. When these guys come in, bang, crash, wallop and go, just be aware that it may not be 100%. So I hope you found that useful. I hope you found that interesting, even if you don't want external wall insulation. But I would say that these people who just go, oh, let's insulate Britain. They don't really know what's involved in it. They don't know how hard it is to insulate some of these places. If you're going to be doing this external wall insulation, you're going to want some kind of render finish on it. You may want to put a brick look back on it. You may be needing planning permission because you're altering the facade of the house, you know, in a conservation area that's going to be particularly critical. You know, there's all kinds of little problems that you've got to look at. Now, if you want more information on this, I attended the excellent Weber Academy. They do a one day course on external wall insulation where you get some hands on experience of using it. You also get a lovely long lecture all morning on all 
all these problems that arise. And there's also a company called the EWI Store. I use the one at Chessington in Surrey, but I think there are other ones around and they have some excellent videos. They've got some excellent information there. They will help you. You can phone them up, you can watch their videos and they will give you loads of product advice. So if you're thinking of doing this yourself, this job yourself, and that means you're gonna do a lot better job because you're gonna take longer to do it, they're the people to talk to before you begin not afterwards. I'm Roger Bisbee, come back and see me soon. We'll have more little whiteboards and things going on. More rants, that's what you want. People keep telling me, do more rants. Mm -hmm.